This week on Africa Update. From Ghanaians to Kenyans, Nigerians to Tanzanians, Africans are spread all over the world in search of knowledge, economic prosperity and better opportunities in different endeavors. But how can Africa make the most of its huge diaspora? We speak with the first African-born Muslim American to be elected as city councillor in Portland, Maine, in the United States, Pius Ali, as he shares his inspiring story. Also on Africa Update, we highlight a Nigeria-Morocco exhibition where cross-cultural artistry meet for mutual economic benefit and preservation of African heritage. Plus, our Africa Roundup, where we highlight some of the biggest stories on the continent. This is Africa Update, reaching you from Trust Television in Abuja, Nigeria's capital. I am Ayuba Ilya. Welcome to the program. Now, in Nigeria, the Yoruba word Japa, to run away, has come to mean leaving the country in search of opportunities abroad. But Japa is a word that is used in different languages across the African continent, as Nigeria is not alone in this. While some travel through legal channels to mostly Western countries and the Middle East, thousands risk their lives as they sojourn through the Mediterranean, running from conflict or seeking economic fortunes. But today it's not about irregular migration, but about a community of Africans who are making the continent proud. One of such Africans in diaspora is Pius Ali, the first African-born Muslim American to be elected as city councillor in Portland, Maine, in the U.S. Here is his story. Pius Ali, the first African-born Muslim American to be elected to a public office in Maine, United States being sworn into office as city councillor in Portland. I was born and raised in Ghana at a place called Nsawam. Pius, a Ghanaian photojournalist whose birth given name is Abdullah, was on a trip to the US to procure photography equipment before he migrated to the United States in 2002. When I was coming up as a public servant, I never knew that what I was doing was going to build up to an elected office. In this interview with Trust TV, he tells us how he penetrated cultural and religious barriers through service to his community. Well, I think uh, elected office, um, it was uh, for me, was an elevation, an elevated platform because I was working with young people in the neighborhood. But then I realized that the challenges that these young people are facing, uh, the odds that have been stuck against them, is not just in the neighborhood that I am. It impacts their parents and then many other people in the community. So if I've been able to help these young people, I've been able to work on the Board of Education to make a change, then uh, the possibilities of me scaling up what I'm doing at the city level um, uh, is possible. And also I believe that uh, the people of the city that I live in have paid close attention to the work that I do. So when I throw my name into the heart or throw my heart into the ring, I came up top. Pius hopes to see an Africa that will compete favorably on the global stage. I would love to see an Africa that is a leader in the world. An Africa we are already providing, we're giving so much to the world. I want to see that reflect in the lives of Africans. I want to see an Africa where if you drive on the streets, you don't see burgers. I want to see an Africa where the African is self-sufficient, taking care of its own business. I want to see an Africa who goes proudly to the world stage, not with an empty plate, asking for something to put into that plate. I want to see an Africa that the world respects and the world give back what we deserve when they take our resources. I want to see an Africa that receives something that is worth the resource that the world is taking away from us. I want to see an Africa whose kids will not be walking from one continent to the other so that they can end up in a country whose culture they don't understand, whose language they don't understand. For Pius, public service is a call he has answered and will continue to impact humanity wherever he finds himself. 
Now joining me to talk about how the African diaspora can contribute to the growth of the African continent is the man himself, Pius Ali. He joins us virtually uh, from Portland, Maine. Thank you so much for joining us on Africa Update, Mr. Pius. Thank you for having me. Well, you're welcome. All right, now let's talk about the role that is being played by the African community in the United States. How would you describe uh, the role of the African diaspora in the U.S. towards the development of the country? Um, I think uh, Africans across the U.S. hold a lot of vital uh, roles. Uh, some of us are working in government. Some of us are working in technology. Some of us are working in education. Uh, hardly will you go through any aspect of uh, uh, the American uh, uh, society without seeing an African name. It could be an African from the North, South, West, or East. We are all over the place, and we are playing a major role in advancing or progressing uh, uh, the American economy, education, uh, civic society, and many other aspects of the current day government or society. But how has the journey been so far? Has it always been like this? You know, how has the country uh, moved from one phase to another in terms of inclusion or acceptability of uh, immigrants? Issues of when immigrants started coming to the U.S. Uh, for African immigrants, uh, it's uh, there were a, a a time that most Africans who came here were coming because of education. Uh, they are some of Africa's elites uh, who can afford education abroad, and then you have those that were given scholarship irrespective of their background. And uh, uh, not long ago, you have a a another phase where uh, a lot of Africans came here through uh, the visa lottery program. And then you have other Africans uh, who came here through uh, regular, uh, somebody getting married and through family ties. And in the most recent, uh, most of the Africans that you have here are either leaving the motherland uh, because of war strife or what I call uh, economic hardships. All right. Well, there's no doubt that the African community has contributed a lot to the growth of the United States. But how is the African diaspora responding to some of the challenges on the African continent at the moment? Well, uh, there is many initiatives uh, going on across the U.S. Um, I, I can say that um, uh, for my Ghanaian side of, uh, uh, of me, uh, that uh, there is a lot of, uh, as you know, uh, every year around this time of the year, a lot of blacks in diaspora, not just from the U.S., are all going to Ghana. And I'm sure that uh, that type of movement is happening global, uh, in the universal African continent. Uh, black people globally are trying to find connection, whether it is black people like me who migrated to the U.S. on our own, or descendants of enslaved Africans who are looking for a connection to something that they call home, or uh, kids of uh, immigrants like me who are growing up in this country and are trying to connect with uh, uh, their roots. One important factor is that uh, the global economy or the global purchasing of uh, people of African descent is changing and it is growing. We are a very huge population with a lot of uh, 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 monetary power that we are looking for places to invest. We are looking for places to support. I think uh, for the African immigrants like us who do send our families, do and does help the economy of our home countries. Um, I don't have the numbers, uh, but it is out there online. All right. All right. So what are some of the hindrances uh, to Africans in diaspora when it comes to investing on the continent uh, from your experience? I think for investment to happen at any given level, uh, the host country or the host business have to earn the trust of uh, uh, the investor. Right. Uh, I think uh, uh, African countries and African leaders uh, need to put in measures 
that will make people trust that once I invest my money here, whether it is one dollar or one million dollars or one billion dollars, it's going to yield uh, um, a good return on investment. Uh, is it safe for me to invest there? What is on the ground that makes me believe that my investment here will do well that my investment in any other part of the world? I think people who invest, that is what they look for. Uh, what is the rate of uh, return on investment uh, and how is their investment uh, safe? You know, if you look at uh, uh, the Western countries, not just Africans in diaspora, the Western uh, powers need to look at Africa as a partner instead of uh, 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 somebody that they give hands out to. And also African leaders need to look at Africa as a capable and able partner to the global uh, um, economy instead of we stretching our hand and ask for handouts. If our politicians and our leaders will do well, like our musicians are doing, um, hardly do you go to a turn on a radio station or go to a uh, an entertainment industry in the in, in the in the global world uh, without uh, hearing an African artist from this or that country play, which shows that uh, for whatever reason our artists have been able to penetrate and break into the global market. I think uh, um, our political and business leaders need to copy uh, uh, from that play. You know, a lot of people have pointed to the fact that uh, the, 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 the fact that you have a lot of African diaspora uh, doing a lot of great things abroad uh, is an indication that there's a lack of political leadership here uh, on the continent. So, uh, because if you look at the fact, if you look at uh, the continent right now, a lot of African countries are dealing with one form of instability or the other. So how can Africa get its political leadership right so that Africa can move forward? Well, first and foremost, we have to do our internal homework, find a way to connect all of Africa. Of course, uh, it's going to be a challenge, but it is possible, right? Uh, Africa is uh, uh, it's a huge uh, continent with a lot of uh, different languages and uh, uh, different cultures. But if there is the political will and uh, uh, the leaders that uphold that will, I think uh, if in the 60s and the 50s, our uh, founders and our uh, forefathers were able to create an organization of African unity, which have become uh, evolved into African Union, the current day African leaders should be able to, their homework is already being cut for them by the founders of most of the modern day African countries. They should be able to strip all the borders and all the uh, 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 challenges that our European colonizers have put in place uh, I, I in thought, a different way than what I, we are doing now. I thought that the AFCT, uh, AFCFTA is, is uh, seeks to address uh, what you just highlighted uh, right now. Yes, but I think we need to expedite that. Even though we, we've not seen the uh, you know implementation in so many uh, quarters. But, I mean, what are some of the areas of collaboration that you like to see uh, between African leaders and the uh, African diaspora uh, community, uh, you know, towards uh, national growth? I think uh, currently those of us who are a Africans in the diaspora, uh, whether we are uh, we are immigrants or we are descendants of uh, enslaved uh, um, African descendants, African descendants of uh, enslaved people of Africa. Uh, there's a lot of us in political positions uh, from um, uh, my level, which is a municipal government, education, all the way to Congress in, uh, uh, and in other parts of the world. Africa need to figure out how the knowledge that we have acquired can be shared with Africans. And I will challenge um, um, like uh, leaders of the African Union to create uh, seats at the African Union for those of us who are out and who are willing and who are interested in becoming part of that so that we can bring some of what we've learned back home and share it with our, uh, with, with our uh, uh, brothers and sisters who are leading the continent. All right. Now, you know, there's, there's been a lot of talk about irregular migration and how that is a major crisis uh, right now. You have a lot of Africans risking their lives 
you know, just to get to Europe or the Middle East or other parts of the world where they think that, you know, there's some uh, level of econo economic opportunities there. Uh, what should every African know before setting out to travel abroad, especially for those seeking economic fortunes? You know, uh, Africa is a thriving market. Uh, I have had people uh, from different parts of Africa paying as much as uh, five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to uh, modern day, for lack of better work, um, uh, for lack of better word, uh, human traders to bring them to the U.S. They will fly from wherever it is in different parts of Africa to South America, and then they will follow uh, a group of people who are trying to get into the U.S. and then they will get to U.S. Once they get to U.S., they become asylum seekers. And then they will have to go through the system. Um, our uh, immigration process here in the U.S., uh, those of us who are in politics are saying that it is broken. We need to fix it. So once you arrive here as an African migrant, you have to be in the system for, yes, there's going to be support for you. But it will depend on how young you are or how old are you. Uh, uh, or where you find yourself in the U.S. 10 years uh, before your stay or you getting used to the environment that you are. It Sorry, did you say 10 years? Just to, to, just to be clear, did you just say 10 years? Just be clear. Yeah, it, yeah, it could take you up to 10 years for you. Um, but for most people, for you to acclimatize and understand the way the system works here, it's like 10 years. That is 10 years of your life, right? Uh, uh, there are others that are lucky, but the average person, it takes you up to 10 years for you to acclimatize and get used and understand what is it that you put yourself into. And if you are older, it's twice the challenge because at certain age, um, you cannot go back to school. Uh, you cannot do certain kind of job. Uh, yes, you will have a place to sleep, you will have a food to eat, and you have something to send home. But is that the type of life that you want to live? Uh, good job. Yes, our economy is not doing well. Um, um, uh, to the leaders of Africa, I think we need to figure out what can we put in place at home in the first place so that our people don't have to be trekking uh, globally, looking for greener pastures or uh, 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 better economic, uh, how do we call it, benefits. All right. Thank you so much for joining us on Africa Update and sharing your experience. We really appreciate that and we look forward to having you join us again uh, subsequently. Thank you. All right. Pius Ali, he is the first African-born Muslim American to be elected as city councillor in Portland, Maine in the United States. This is Africa Update on Trust Television, reaching you from Abuja, Nigeria's capital. After the break, we'll take a look at cross-cultural artistry for mutual economic benefits and preservation of African heritage. Join us again. All right, thank you for staying with us. Now, the preservation of craft work is an important part of upholding a country's identity, origin, and culture as it serves as a mirror that reflects its cultural and historical richness, especially in Africa. It is against this backdrop that Nigeria and Morocco are harnessing handcrafts for the economic benefit of both nations and also strengthening bilateral relations between them. Take a look. <laughs> It's the first of its kind as Nigeria and the Kingdom of Morocco showcase their rich culture through an exhibition of handcrafted traditional dresses, bags, shoes, interior decorations, jewelry, artistic carpentry and kitchen utensils, among others. This is a collaboration between the Sokoto Chamber of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture and the Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Services of Morocco to promote culture and trade for the mutual benefit of the economies of both nations. We benefit the country in terms of internal generated revenue because we are, going, we are promoting art and craft. That is the basic of this so that creativity, people who are doing things with hand, 
the, we will borrow from technology from Morocco so that we can enhance most of the clauses you see here 95 percent are handmade in furtherance of the existing relationship between the two countries the kingdom of Morocco's ambassador to Nigeria and the commissioner for commerce and industry Sokoto state who spoke on behalf of governor of Sokoto state Aminu Tambol noted that the collaboration is timely as the rich cultural heritage of both regions is necessary for boosting internally generated revenues Nigeria and Morocco are also linked by centuries-old history, which means that the two countries share the same culture. This exhibition will allow the Nigerian public to discover the multiple forces of Moroccan crafts and culture. Pro State in particular has been trading with Morocco via third parties I, learned, I, I, I listened to what the uh, ambassador said, especially in leather goods. Uh, a lot of leather from Sokoto Red Goat, which is the best, as the uh, experts say, in the world, finds its way through Kano to Morocco and to, to Europe. This kind of uh, gathering should see how we can foster a relationship that we can deal directly um, without the third parties and uh, also build on the existing mutually beneficial relationships. This new collaboration, which comes after an earlier successful solar energy and fertilizer production agreement, seeks a closer working relationship between the Sokoto Caliphate and the Kingdom of Morocco in the areas of religion, education and culture. All right, thank you for staying. Now, let's take a look at Africa Roundup, some of the bigger stories from across the continent. The first formal peace talks aimed at ending two years of war between the Ethiopian army and the forces from the country's northern region of Tigray started in South Africa. The talks mediated by the African Union begin as the government has been making significant gains on the battlefield, capturing several large towns in Tigray over the past week. The African Union mediation team is led by former Nigerian President Olushagun Obasanjo, supported by former Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta and former Deputy President of South Africa Mpumzile Mlambo Nchuka. United Nations and the United States representatives participated as observers, the African Union has said. Now, Democratic Republic of Congo's President Felix Tshisekedi will serve as a facilitator for the political transition process in Chad, Central Africa's main regional body said. The Economic Community of Central African States held an emergency summit in Kinshasa to discuss the situation in Chad after about 50 people were killed in protest against military leader Mohamed Idris Derby. Derby has said he will organize elections in 2024 reneging on an initial promise to hand over power after 18 months. Opposition parties and civil society groups have been calling for protest to demand a quicker return to democracy, including the demonstrations last week that led to clashes. Heavy thunder showers and hailstorms hit large parts of Greater Cairo, including the Egyptian capital, as well as several provinces. As a result, streets were flooded and traffic disrupted when the densely populated capital is used to, to more than 200 days of sunshine a year. The Egyptian Meteorological Authority issued a warning of unstable weather conditions nationwide, according to local media. Sub-Saharan Africa has been particularly affected. Countries including South Sudan, Chad, Cameroon, or Nigeria are experiencing worst floods in decades. The current chairman of the Air Corps, Omaro Sissoko Mbalo, was welcomed in Moscow by President Vladimir Putin for discussion on trade and peace talks. Omaro says discussions centered around the message of all 15 countries representing the economic community of West African states on situation of the war between two sister nations, Russia and Ukraine, the question of grain and wheat. According to estimates by the International Monetary Fund, global inflation will peak at 9.5% this year, 
but it will bite hardest in developing countries. President Putin hailed Russia's and Guinea-Bissau's long-lasting friendly relations, adding that he hoped to further develop trade, economic and humanitarian ties. A second Russia-African summit is being expected in 2023 in St. Petersburg. And then finally, the Central Bank of Nigeria announced plans to redesign the 200, 500 and 1,000 Naira note. Governor of the Central Bank, Godwin Emefele, disclosed this during a special press briefing in Abuja. Emefele said that the redesign will take effect from Thursday, December 15, 2022. He also said that existing notes will cease to be regarded as legal tender by January 31, 2023. The CBN is worried that 85% of the currency in circulation is being hoarded by Nigerians. Emirfele said that the redesigning of Naira notes will help to curb counterfeit notes as well as hamper ransom payment to terrorists and kidnappers. Well, that's our show for today. You can watch more via all our social media platforms. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch us again next week. I am Ayuba Ilya. Bye for now.